of the Night. I'm an instructor with the Bryn Mawr Film Institute, and my film recommendation this week is Sweet Smell of Success, an independent studio film directed by Alexander McKendrick in 1957, starring Burt Lancaster, also a producer of the film, and Tony Curtis. It has a killer script by Clifford Odets and Ernest Lehman, inky cinematography by the great James Wong Howe, and the sleaziest, greasiest score by Elmer Bernstein. This film is, to borrow one of its famous lines, a cookie full of arsenic, a downright nasty little noir in the very best sense of that adjective. Tony Curtis is our film's protagonist, a fast-talking press agent named Sidney Falco, who lives and dies by getting his client's names in the hallowed gossip column of J.J. Hunsecker, played with mellow jurist magnetism by Burt Lancaster. When we meet Sidney at the film start, he clearly is not smelling what success is cooking. Sidney is in a particular bind because J.J. is shutting him out of his wildly influential column in Retribution. You see, J.J. asks Sidney to do him a favor on the sly, break up a relationship between J.J.'s kid sister Susie and a jazz musician named Steve Dallas, and Sidney didn't do a good enough job. The film's plot proceeds to coil its way around all manners of scheming, backstabbing, dirty tricks, and manipulation as Sidney tries to claw his way back into J.J.'s good graces in any way he can. Like other late period film noirs, this is a bleak and labyrinthine film, and its characters are not pinned by fate to their outcomes, as often seems to be the case in earlier noirs. Here they all freely choose to be awful. All this being said, you will not be able to resist this film's gleefully kinetic energy and verve, and especially its razor wit. Every aspect of this film is incredibly well considered, but arguably its greatest and most memorable strength is its script, and the purpose its Baroque dialogue serves in the larger context of the film's themes. First, the script is sharp like a knife, and is absolutely wielded like one to kill careers and reputations. Second, the dialogue is meant to pull us into its speaker's thrall. Sentences are flashed almost like shiny jewels in front of us to both distract us and to beguile us. The, char the charisma of a good talker is undeniable, and JJ and Sydney, while absolutely repugnant people in their own special ways, are undeniably charismatic and stand in sharp contrast to the film's romantic couple, Steve and Susie who are two slices of white bread in comparison. The way whiplash conversations are filmed to heighten this lingo ledger domain is also one of the magnificent pleasures of the film. You'll frequently encounter a group of characters having a conversation wherein some of the group knows much more than the other and metaphorically take people in the group hostage with their words without them even knowing about it. Sydney, for example, will be engaging one person, addressing them head on, but through innuendo and stylized language, every word he says is actually being explicitly directed to a person he is not looking at. The blocking, that is to say, where actors are directed to stand and move in a scene, is genius in these scenarios as character focus ebbs and flows based on these intricate dynamics in the dialogue. Famed screenwriter Ernest Lehman was responsible for the foundation of the script, adapting it from a novella he himself wrote, but leftist playwright Clifford Odets was largely responsible for the film's dazzling dialogue. And knowing Odets was at the helm of the script, you can read into the extra bite in the film's satire of Hunsecker's demagoguery, considering former Communist Party member Odets was still reeling with self-loathing for cooperating with the House Un-American Activities Committee and naming names of other former Communist Party members earlier in the decade. Audiences seeing this in 1957 would have immediately recognized J.J. Hunsecker as a thinly veiled depiction of a real life person, Walter Winchell, infamous for his gossip column and broadcasting work, and for his highly stylized writing and even higher connections. 
Winchell became deeply anti-communist and fully embraced McCarthyism in the 50s. And while Sweet Smell of Success is certainly not the first film to have a deeply cynical take on the press, it certainly deals with issues like McCarthy-esque manipulations of the media head on. One of the film's most compelling questions is whether Sidney Falco has any shred of a soul or the potential even to be a good person. He seems to have moral lines he finds, let's say, troubling to cross, but is capable of boundless cruelty to innocent people, people who care about him even. This was Tony Curtis's first significant role working against his teen idol reputation at the time, a reputation which is slightly skewered in some of the sharp barbs in the film's dialogue. Sweet Soul Success was a flop at the box office in 1957, partly because Curtis's fan base probably wasn't too keen on seeing him play such a slimy, ruthless, and misogynist character. It's important to make the distinction, though, that while Sydney is all of those things, the film itself is in fact a subtle but extremely powerful critique of toxic masculinity and domineering patriarchy. You'll find Sweet Smell Success available for viewing on multiple online platforms. And next week, I hope you join me and Bryn Mawr Film Institute's Senior Director of Education, Andrew Douglas, as we discuss this film on Monday the 18th at 6.30 p.m. I cannot wait to hear what you have to say about it. Until then, bye.